Okay. Well, we'll go ahead and get going here. Dr. McCabe, uh, long time no see. How have you been? Man, I'm good. I'm good. I'm, Staying uh, busy. You know, it's good. I, it, I'm uh, <clears throat> working on a project that I had put on the shelf for a while just because I have time. So it's nice. Is uh, is that the uh, Catalyst School? No, Catalyst School okay. is going forward. And I'll, I'll talk to everybody about that in a minute. But I had written the first draft of the book, Stuck in Suckville, um, which is important what a lot of people struggle with. And I didn't like the first draft because it sucked. So I put it on the shelf and we launched Catalyst School instead. But now during this time, I've been allowed to go back and, and, and finish. And I essentially rewrote the book in about five days. And uh, I'm much, much ple more pleased with it. So great. Yeah, great. Uh, so, you know, one of the things I think we want to start out with is, you know, given we're um, in this current state of affairs, and this is something that you and I talked about briefly before, but just starting with giving everybody an idea about, you know, talking stress and anxiety, because this is one of those times where it, it sort of stretches beyond uh, the golf course. And, hey, everybody, if I can make sure everybody mutes their mic too, I'd appreciate it. I'll go through and check, but if you could for background noise. Um, but we're dealing with a lot of stress and anxiety, uh, Brett. So just talk about that a little bit for us, would you? Yeah, you know, and, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. You know, it, it's, I think on Tuesday, the governor of Alabama decided to um, delay it two more weeks. And it was kind of really like a, a kick in the shins. Um, I don't know how much infection rate we have here. Um, Downtown Birmingham has got a little bit of an issue, but we've been able to play golf during this time and the weather's been absolutely ridiculously good. But our community in, in, in the essence is, you know, we're trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and so when, when this started, you know, I was on the range at TPC Sawgrass and I left on Friday morning and I, um, I came home and I was kind of lost for the weekend and I didn't know what to do, didn't know where to go. And I started thinking about what we were going through and the unprecedented nature, um, had no idea it was going to impact us like this. Um, and there's been some silver linings, nowhere near minimizing what's happened to us, but we're so resourceful. So I started thinking about it from a kind of a psychological coping side is that, you know, there are really three phases that we need to focus on. The first phase is the endurance phase. And unfortunately we're still there. Um, I didn't think we would still be here at this point, but the endurance phase is the uncertain ending. It's the hardest period of continuing to push through without an end in sight. I think we know that some ends are coming, but I mean, you know, when, when the Virginia governor announced months ago that it would go until end of May, I, it's just like, there's no way. I mean, there's just no way. Um, and, you know, the, the way that the news media and the way that our, our information transmission is going on right now is that there's a lot of the uncertainty, the fear and the negativity is driving. So the endurance time for all of us as practitioners, as people who are serving the needs of others that are working in an uncertain future can be overwhelming and exhausting. But what happens during that time is we start really focusing on the things that we can't control. We start worrying about the other two phases, which are the emergence phase and then the execution phase. The emergence phase is the sandwich between where we will be and where we are now. It's how we start putting all our pieces back together. At a board meeting last night for our club, and we were talking about um, in, in next in two weeks from today when they reopen the restaurants, our general manager is begging for us not to open that weekend. He's like, I can't get my staff in here and trained and 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 resourced. You know, he said all I'm gonna do is upset everybody. So we're creating different scenarios. That's the emergence, right? The emergence phase is what are the pieces, what's the new normal going to look like? What, is the, what are the ways that we're going to manage it? But we're going to have a lot of energy. We're going to have a lot of arousal. We're going to have a lot of excitement once we turn that corner. Um, the execution phase is what is it going to look like when, you know, we have to go to events. You know, I, I hear a lot of people saying, oh, I don't know if we're ever going to have in-person conventions again. Yeah, we will. Okay. It's just going to be different. Um, you're going to see probably... Every time you go to a restaurant, the people serving you are going to be wearing masks. I think that's going to be normal for a couple of years until that slowly re relaxes. Um, and so, you know, even for me, the things that, you know, we lost from a business standpoint, we essentially lost two thirds of our revenue because of the switch, you know, because of the downturn. And we were fortunate enough to have things in place to allow us to continue to persevere and push through. But 
it allowed me to look back at it and say, okay, during this endurance time, what do we need to focus on? Our coping mechanisms that we all have are the, the skills by which we meet the demands of stress. Those are part, those are core and elements to all of us. I'm a clinician by training. I'm a clinician by license. Um, my specialty was stress management, the role of stress on medical conditions. This is pretty close to what we are doing right now. And, um, and so I think it's, we have to look at the fact that our coping mechanisms by nature have been um, bombarded. The normal way of by which we normally cope is social connection, social, um, social support. Take that away from us. Now we have found new ways to do it. Thank God this happened in 2020 and not 1980 when we wouldn't have been able to have these types of connections. Um, but, you know, I think we all get caught up on things that we can't control. Um, I, I gave a talk yesterday to one of my athletic departments and the athletic department personnel. And I said, each and every one of us should really have to identify three scenarios, the return to quote normal, the not return, and then the hybrid approach. And, you know, what is your business going to look like? How do you want to start summer camps? How do you want to teach? How do you want to, um, you know, move your, your world? Then what happens if we sit here and we have a re-blossoming, a re-blooming of this and we can't get it under control? Then what? Um, and then, you know, what's the hybrid approach and what are, we, what are the individual factors that contribute us to managing this? I think that's all an exercise that we should all do. You know, we, we may argue that it's worthless of time. But the reality of the fact is, before we take off on every airplane, they teach us what to do in case of a crash. 99.9999% of the time, we don't need to do it. I hope we never have to do it. So, you know, I, it, it, it's one of the things like, why when I'm at Sawgrass, did none of my players hit a ball off the 17th drop area? But then when they hit a ball in the water in a tournament, they panic. I'm like, why didn't we practice hitting shot? Well, I didn't want to think negatively. No, it's called thinking rationally. Like we have to be prepared so that we're not shocked. And this is, this is giving us a lot of time to learn, to grow, to develop. But I also want you guys to look at it from a perspective of this is also giving you guys each, each and every one of you, each and every one of y'all, the opportunity to know what makes you tick and why you love doing what you do. What is it that's the core element of being a coach, a teacher, a leader, a manager, um, you know, whatever it is within the industry that drives you, what is it that makes you tick? And what is it that you want to accomplish? Because I know for me, um, you know, we get caught running in the, the day by day and the every day goes and the next thing you know, that day is over. We wake up the next day, we go again, and we sometimes forget that opportunity. And coping can in, be enhanced when we can reconnect to our fire and our purpose a little bit better. Is there a long term effect, do you think, to the lack of uh, physical interaction, personal to person, not in this, I, I'm not counting obviously this as, a, as that kind of interaction, but you know what I mean? Like on the lesson tee and the daily uh, on the golf course and at our clubs and facilities, is there a, is there a long-term impact to that, to, to people when we start to uh, sort of that gap between doing it and not doing it uh, and being in front of people kind of stretches out? I think anytime we're away from our skill execution, there's going to be a skill dulling. Um, but you just have to give yourself a little bit more compassion and grace when you go back. Um, you know, the, the best examples we can use of that is when we have return of um, prisoners of war. Um, they, they can reconnect pretty well, but they still have trauma and they still have scars there that can sometimes impact. Um, you know, I think it's, it's one of those things of, how do you manage this? Um, it's a good question from Jim. Can trauma at an early age help build emotional resilience? Mm -hmm. It can do one of two things. Um, there's some really powerful data that's come out of some of the um, some of the hospital data about early trauma for young people. It can blunt them or n or numb them. So that's why you see a lot of reoffensive um, revictimization of those individuals because their threat um, spectrum is not as strong. Um, they tend to mistrust. But um, there's also those that if you live in an environment where you've got healthy coping mechanisms as a result, you can be very effective. I'll give you a personal example. Uh, my mom grew up in the hills of Tennessee. I'm talking like the hills. Still today, they're stuck in the 80s. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable how far behind they are. Um, and she was a twin sister. And her oldest sister 
uh, it was a very chaotic home life. It was a very poor family. She had an outhouse until she was nine, one room schoolhouse till she was 10. Um, the, her, her dad was very um, unstable, very unpredictable. The older sister was, you know, the traditional in the hills of Tennessee, pregnant at 15, married at 16, divorced at 17, four kids type of thing. Um, and very, very low, uh, very poor functioning. She and her, her twin sister got out of there at 18 um, and built a life for themselves. My mom, though, for some reason, decided to always use therapy. She'd always search out a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a counselor to help her manage. Her sister, her twin sister, didn't. And it was stark differential between how they functioned in life. And my mom was always the caretaker. So what we have to do is look at how people embrace and are accepted and taught. What I've tried to do with all of my people, let's say people with a variety of different settings is to say, okay, what is the factor and the form that you can use during this time to get better? Um, you know, one of the things that I have learned from myself is I don't need to be as frenetically busy as I thought I did. Um, I did a lot of things that I don't think brought me much value. It doesn't mean I didn't enjoy it at times when I started it, but I felt that there were things that I did in my business and that I, that I, that I, that caused other sacrifices to happen. And I have found that I've become much more connected to what brought me into the business. It hasn't changed my relationship with me teaching. It hasn't changed my relationship with me working with my clients. In fact, it's actually hype heightened that. Um, but there were a lot of things that I did that I just, I thought that I had to do because I saw it. So, you know, it's the way that we cope. One of the most important things that we can do in any kind of coping or traumatic environment is even like you're talking, Mark, about going back out on the T is to be aware that you feel different out there. Like I haven't been out here in three months. This is great to be back out here versus judging ourselves to think why, I mean, I should be so happy. I should be excited. I should, no, you shouldn't be. You are what you are. <clears throat> that's okay. That's okay. And, and I think that's the, the brilliance. I, one of my old roommates is a um, trauma orthopedic surgeon. And in Louisiana, they allowed them to start surgery again yesterday. That wasn't an emergency. And he, to, uh, he posted a picture about how excited he was to be back in the surgical suite. And, you know, he, he sent me a message. He goes, I was so nervous. I mean, you know, it was a surgeon. But he was like, I just, I just was nervous. Okay, good. That's okay. We need to learn to embrace those things and, and, and more importantly, understand that we are, we're a little bit like the flag that gets moved by the wind. We're strong and anchored by the, the flagpole, but we do move with the, the currents that shift us at times. And that's okay. The more flexible we are mentally, the better we can be. To be able to be in a stressful situation and not think it's personal. To be in a situation of judgment or somebody's critiquing us and not take it as personal as we want to, um, is to look at it and say, okay, I got to separate the message from the madness here for a minute. The more skills, the higher emotionally intelligent skills that we can pull in, the better we're going to be in those situations. Brett, do you have any uh, sort of, uh, for lack of a better word, tips or suggestions for, because, you know, obviously everybody on here is, most everybody is going to be teaching at some level about helping understand uh, how people learn best. I mean, we've been sort of taught this visual kinesthetic, um, whatever the other one is, I'm forgetting yeah. it, it doesn't matter. But what are some of the ways that you sort of individualize what you do and figure out how you're best gonna connect with a person in front of you? So a couple, um, about a year ago, I, I put out a video and I'm happy to get you guys that information. I've got videos for your students too that are free if you want them. Um, just send me a message and we'll do it. But I put out a thing about my psycholo what I psychologically look at for every player I work with. And I put it out for, for teachers and then we didn't really do a great job of marketing it. So it ended up in our, um, our file vault. Um, but th that's what kind of led to our catalyst school right now, which is this. Look, the first thing that you always must do as a coach, as a teacher, as a leader is to connect to the person in front of you. Okay, so we'll stop it there. That's what you're talking about. When we connect to the person, if, you, if you're meeting me and you say, oh, Brett was a college baseball player, he's a good athlete, I should be able to tell him what he needs to do. 
no, not really. Um, I, I had that problem. I went and saw a, a top 100 instructor early in my career playing golf. And um, I say career, I mean, my hobby of playing golf. Um, and he was like, you got to keep your right elbow tucked. Well, as a former pitcher, I can't feel where my elbow is. I can feel where my hand is beautifully because I've done it for so long. I know where my hand moves in space, but I have no feeling of where my elbow is. That's not important to a pitcher. Um, you know, they may teach elbow location and angle, but they're going to do it through a different way. So what I always do from a connection standpoint is I take a little time asking, you know, what do your parents do for a living? Even if they're adults, what do you do for a living? What do you like? You know, there's not one way of learning. Not People aren't one way visual, one way auditory. But I always ask them, how do you like to learn? Do you like trial and error? Or do you like me to put you in a position? And and you, if you ask them, they'll tell you. They may say, I don't know. So, well, okay, well, why don't we do some trial and error until we figure it out? And I think we have to understand the psychological fingerprint of every person we teach. Every single person you teach is going to be unique and different. They're not going to be like somebody else. They may have elements, but not 100%. Um, there are certain people you can, you know, if you have an engineer, okay, somebody who's got a very engineering mind, you can throw all kinds of angles, attacks, everything. If you've got an artist, you better be talking about the canvas, okay? Um, and so asking them those questions is just basic understanding and connection to them. You are allowed to make mistakes as a coach in learning who your player is. I always tell my players, I've been fired. I had an LPGA player I've worked with on three separate occasions. She keeps coming back, and my wife said, that's it, no more. Um, because she fired me one day because we – talked about it she went out and played at a tournament and I said well I'm still learning you and she said well you should know me by now okay we're a dynamic individual right we're constantly changing and so she fired me and called back about six months later um and and I should have not taken the call then either um but we we are constantly learning and I think every player you have you should have notes on them uh what they like I learned a skill from a, a business advisor one time that was brilliant. He said, you know, you got your contact form on your phone and at the bottom of it has notes section. Well, why don't you write the things down about them? Mom's name is Jan. Dad's name is Bob. Bob is an accountant. Jan is um, a brilliant chef, amateur chef, has three sisters, whatever. So when they call you, that pops up every time. Or when you're working with them, you know some elements of them. Um, you know why people are motivated and what they like and what they don't like. You don't have to have a, a formal booklet, but that is really, really helpful if you see that perspective. And more importantly, if you understand the things that they trigger. I had a, I had a, a teaching professional come to see me a couple of years ago. Very good player. Very, very good player. Like really, really good. And he played in college, but every time that he hit a certain shot, he had this really bad reaction to it. And the shot was fine. It was good. But to him, it, it had something to do with the way that his college coach used to teach, that that shot was a sign of an ineffective player. Okay. So to him, when he saw that shot and it turned out fine, it was, God, see, that's why I can't play under pressure. So what was happening was he was taking that one moment as a reason as to why he struggled under pressure. No wonder why he struggled under pressure. He had built up this mental framework that just beat him to death when the reality was it didn't matter. Like, I mean, you know, in baseball as a pitcher, we threw, you know, hanging curveballs all the time that didn't get hit out. We just shook it off and laughed it off. Um, and so what you have to do is, is understand what those psychological triggers are. Every one of us is formed across three major areas. It's, it's the biopsychosocial model. The biologics, the psychological, and the social. This is everybody you meet with. The biologics. What are the contributions from a biological standpoint? Who are they raised by? What are their genetics? Who are their people? I mean, if you've got, you know, like I said, mom and dad are both engineers, more than likely your kid is going to think in a very linear and concrete manner. The social, the psychological. How do you solve problems? What are the underlying beliefs? Um, how do you see the world? Um, and so on. And then the social is how do you interact with other people? Those are really important. Now, I also believe that there's an interaction side. And to me, there are four types of people in the way we interact. This is based on a matrix. The matrix is based on um, how, how much knowledge do they have in the topic, okay? 
and how agreeable are they with you? So people that are high agreement with you and high knowledge are what I call aligned. You could come in and say, hey, look, we're, we're jamming, right? But I want you to try this. I want you to do this. And you could fail, but you're usually okay with it, okay? They're going to try to figure it out more and more. They're going to try to figure out, but they're, they want to learn and your job is to feed them. And most of the time, you're going to feed them information that's consistent with you. The exact opposite person is what I call the dismissive. They don't have a clue what you're talking about, but they don't want you to know that. Okay. And so their knowledge is really low and they just don't like you. More than likely in teaching, you don't have a whole lot of those. They are going to bail and fire you pretty quickly. The problem is they don't really know what they're talking about. Okay. They've, they've either been influenced by somebody or they've got an idea on something, but when they use their deflection and they use their pushback as a way to keep you away from them. Okay, so let's get rid of those two. The next two are the critical ones. People that are high agreement with you, but really don't know what they're talking about are what I call accommodators. Oh yeah, 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 that's great, that's great. And you know when they leave, they ain't gonna do it. They don't understand it. Like, and so you sit there and you say, hey, I want you to do this. Okay, yeah, yeah. oh, it's awesome, I love that, yes. And they make you feel so good. Then they leave and you're like, there's no chance. The problem is most of us fall for it. We're like, Haha, I got them solved. They, and you start watching them play and you're like, they're not doing anything I've taught them to do. But they're like, man, you're the best teacher ever. And they use that as a way of not being exposed. It's a powerful defense mechanism. The other one is the one that scares us, but don't be scared by. It's the fact that they disagree with you but they really know what they're talking about, okay? I call them antagonists because they're gonna be antagonistic to you. They're gonna be like, I don't agree with that. And, but they know what they're talking about. And in the golf swing, it's unique because we have so much information out there, but not all of it's good information. And not all, all of it. So you have to find the, the, the threads of um, commonality there to build from. And your job is to find that link where you guys can agree and be like, look, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. You and I disagree on this, but this is, we're saying the same thing over here. Okay, and you start building that. And it may be somebody that you say, hey, look, you know, I have a, I was doing a little studying on the swing the other night or studying on this. What do you think? I thought I would, I'd ask you that. And you're involving them. They're brilliant. They know what they're talking about. And a lot of times from a player standpoint, good players who kind of have homemade ways of doing it, we see them as antagonistic, but what they've done is they've taken what somebody's taught them and translated it to a way that they can repeat. Like for me, um, you know, I don't, I don't have the best looking swing. Um, you know, I've got a strong grip, narrow stance. I tend to be barely down, but I'm a good player. And if you told me that I have to keep my, you know, I have to find the feel that works for me. And the feel that works for me is I feel like the, 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 I got to feel like either my left shoulder is staying in or my left hip, which is the feel that I use from pitching, or I got to feel like the handle stays in front of the club face. Now, I'm not saying it's pulling on the handle, but that's just the feel. You can tell me all the reasons why, but in my mind, that's how I've translated. And so I wouldn't teach. I don't teach the swing. I would never teach anybody to do what the hell I do, um, but I can play the game. And so what I want you to always do is to, to tell people like, okay, this is repeat it back to me in the way that you like it. And that's going to show you how they like to listen, to learn, and it's going to form that foundation. So then we, that sort of leads into uh, dealing with expectations, Brett. Yeah. And we, we spend a lot of time dealing with that with people on, on different levels, uh, especially maybe, you know, newer students. Uh, they have this picture of where they want to be, but they, their expectations don't match up with, effort level, time, all that stuff. So expectations, good or bad, and, and dealing with that with people in general. In general, expectations are terrible because they're based on fear and doubt. They're based on hope. I hope to play better, so I expect it. Like when you ask somebody, they say, I expect you to play better than that. Why? Like, why? Oh, because you had a good week of practice. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. So you had a good breakfast yesterday, so you assume tomorrow night's dinner is going to be great. Okay, and that's what I try to tell them. It's like every day is a new challenge. I've got a girl that I've worked with for a long time who is so in Suckville right now, which I can talk about later. But 
and the other day she said she's a collegiate tennis player so talented so good at what she does but she just buries herself in frustration and it finally came out she said well I had a good day yesterday so I expected to play good today and as soon as I don't see the success I get mad at myself and I just tank I'm like why do you expect to play good well I know I'm good I said then fight to play good don't expect to play good expectations you know truly trusting players have demands and behaviors that they follow People who don't really believe the future is going to be better expect it to be better. Okay. So I want players to never think golf is going to be easy. I want players to think that the golf course is an obstacle course. Like, wouldn't it be cool if we changed the entire presentation of golf and said, there's a trap door somewhere on seven. There's a windmill that's going to eat your ball on 12. It's going to be hard out there, y'all. Let's see what we got versus you know, all the books that have been written about this glorious walk in the spirit of the moment, right? I think it's great when it's great. It's amazing. But, you know, I, I try to get them to understand. It's like if you've ever had one of those nights where you and your friends had nothing really planned and you ended up at a restaurant when we were allowed to be together. And, and then the next thing you know, it led to three things that happened. And it's just this epic night, right? You ever tried to recreate it? Bombs. Terribly. So you can't force things from happening. So what I always tell them is expect nothing. You have no idea how you're going to play today. Go in there with the mindset that you're going to face each challenge. You're going to fight to make the most out of each challenge. And we're going to create the outcome we want. Believe that you can play well, but it may not happen today. Believe that you have the skills, but it may not happen today, but keep chopping, keep pushing, keep going. So why, uh, why is uh, change so difficult for people? You know, that's, that's at the crux of what we do, you know, change at some level has to happen if people want to get better, but why is it so difficult for the vast majority of people? Well, change. So the, psychologically, anytime we make, we only change for one of two reasons. We either have to, or we really, really want to. Okay. That's the top layer. So I have to change because you told me I'm going to, um, I'm going to die if I don't change my diet. Well, people are going to change until the point that the doctor says it's not the problem anymore. Okay. Um, really, really want to is the example of going on vacation or going to a high school reunion. Okay. We get in shape. Outside of that, most of the change that we get is we're not all in or somebody's introduced it to us. And what happens is the first emotion that pops up is resistance. So we go into a bargaining power and it, it's, it comes across four things. What is the advantage of me changing versus what is the advantage of me staying the same? What is the advantage of me not changing? And what is the advantage of me not, um, uh, what is the disadvantage of me not changing? And what is the disadvantage of me changing? All right, so in other words, we're basing it, but we also have to look at it. What is the cost effect, right? If you told me to change my grip, I probably need to. I don't want to. I don't want to take the, the months. I don't want to take the year. I don't want to take the struggle of not feeling comfortable. I am willing to accept the mistakes that I make in my game because I don't want to change that. So there's a cost that we have to play. And that cost is asking ourselves, is the behavior change worth it? Okay. Um, and, and do I believe I can do it? So there's a couple of factors that always go into change, but we're most of the time for most of us, when we change, we don't really want to go into the doldrums that we're going to go into. We think we can on the, on the front end, but we want to get out of it as soon as we can down the road. That's why it makes it difficult. Uh, so uh, John Dunnigan put up a question here. and I think we, we talked a little bit in the beginning about stress and anxiety, uh, but I, I'm going to want to hit the last part of John's question, though, yeah. during this lockdown stuff, sort of lack of motivation. Yeah, uh, it, it can be kind of difficult, you know, given everybody's situation and the situations are, are varying state to state and place to place. But lack of I don't motivation. Know if you guys saw earlier in the week, Rory said he went out and hit balls for the first time in seven weeks. Shane Lowry saying the same thing, right? Um, I had a call from one of my players last night and he's like, I'm playing golf, but I'm just not motivated. I've been doing a lot of webinars with my colleges, athletes about not being motivated. Motivation. Okay. It should come from the inside. It doesn't really, okay? I mean, 
you know, it should be intrinsically created, but it doesn't. Most of us are motivated by something on the hill that we want or something that's coming after us. It's just who we are. It will switch to intrinsic over time. But fear is a brilliant motivator short term. So is desire. Okay. The brain's main two functions are to keep you alive long enough to allow yourself to have kids, really, um, and put your genes in the next generation for survival of the fittest mindset. Um, so why would we be motivated right now? We have an uncertain ending. That's the problem. We don't know when this is ending. Motivation will naturally bump back up once we have some certainty. So I've told all my players, take this time and get away from it. Same with coaches. I mean, you know, I'm motivated in some areas. I'm not motivated in others. It's really hard to stay on top of motivation without some sort of reinforcement cycle that happens. So right now, I'd rather you just give yourself the flexibility and the freedom to say, you know what? It's just a weird time right now. And this endurance phase is about surviving this. When it first happened, a lot of the universities and the players I worked with, they were going to get in shape. And they, shit, I didn't make it past two weeks. I mean, people were like, I'm not doing that. Because what am I, if I was a college pitcher and they told me to go throw bullpens, my first question would be, why? What am I throwing bullpens for? So what I've told all of my players to do in golf is don't go out there, unless you're going through a massive swing change. I got one player going through that right now. Um, but unless you're going through a massive swing change, use this time to reconnect to the love of what you do in the game. Go out and be a player. Don't be a professional. Go out there and enjoy the game. If you want to put music on and have a drink, do that. Go back to what brought you into the game. What you're doing right now on May 1st in the middle of a quarantine and a lockdown is not going to have any predictive value of what you do January or July 14th when you're in the midst of a tournament. I, I ask each of them, what do you need? Three weeks to get ready? Yeah. Okay. Well, when that happens, that natural fear-based motivator is going to spark. We just need to be disciplined during that time. So motivation is normal right now. I mean, you know, I'm used to having nine to 10 clients a day lined up in my calendar. This is the only thing I have today. I mean, I'm not complaining right now. Thank you. So uh, I'm able to write. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm really, really good. I I'm loving uh, it. All right. So Jim threw up another question here. Uh, what's the best way for juniors to manage their emotions and physiology under pressure? Physiology or psychology, Jim? Uh, both. Um, yeah. You know, I think the first thing, Jim, that's a great question. The physiology. First thing is physiology. Okay. So the first thing that I would tell you is to teach them that what they feel is normal. Okay. And I would explain to them why we feel the way we feel. The brain fires off increased arousal. Okay. And I teach them what arousal is. Hey, you know, like increased heart rate. You got a little sick to your stomach. You got to go to the bathroom. Your hands get a little sweaty. Why? Well, it's trying to prepare it for an uncertainty. I said, if, if, if I told you it was Christmas morning and right around this other side of the table, there was unbelievable amount of presents. You'd be excited, right? Yeah. Okay. It's the same feeling. But when we're in an uncomfortable spot, our mind can't fail. It has to predict. And it has to predict negative. So if I said, and I'll tell kids this, all right, look, we're going to do a game. I'm going to put you outside of a forest. And there's a lot of gold inside the forest at a, at a, at a shack. Would you be excited? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Let's go. Okay. If I put you there at midnight, how would you feel? I'd probably be a little scared. Why? Well, it's dark. I don't, but it's, you were, it's the same scenario. We just changed the day of time, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, if I told you that pathway has had seven bear attacks in the last week. <gasps> oh, no. I said, now, if you're walking through there at night and you started hearing cracking, what are you going to think? It's a bear. Okay. Is it a bear? It's got to be a bear. You told me it was going to be a bear. I said, no. I said, there's going to be bear attacks in the past, not today. But you can't miss that it's a bear, right? So if you saw a bear, what would you do? You'd either run or you'd freeze and fight it. Mostly run. Okay, so I said, so your mind is going to tell you this is a terrible situation and it starts building up the fear. Yeah. I said, okay, now if I had taught you to be a bear hunter, for two weeks, and you're the best bear hunter I've ever seen, and I gave you a bear hunting gun. And now I said, hey, 
There's been seven bear sightings out on that woods. If you can get a bear, you win twice what's in the cabin. Now, what do you think? Oh, I'm gonna find me that bear. Same bear, same environment. You're ready for it, okay? But you don't know where the bear is gonna come. You don't know if it's gonna come at you from behind either, do you? No, but I'll be ready for it, exactly. So what I try to get them to do is to realize that they can take on anything that comes their way. But what happens is our mind starts telling stories. And I say, you ever watched a horror movie with music, without the music? They're like, uh-uh, go on YouTube and play a horror movie where they've taken the sound off, okay? The Jaws theme, this is the greatest thing. I had a, a girl that I was working with as a tennis player at Bama, and she's from like Germany. And I played the Jaws theme. She had no, she had no clue what it was, and she goes, Oh, that's so exciting. And I'm like, any American who hears the Jaws theme is automatically thinking, I ain't letting my finger, my, my feet dangle in the water, right? And so what I do is I'll play that theme and I'll say, what does that make you feel? Oh, trouble's coming. Okay, then I play the Rocky theme. Dun, 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 John, I'm gonna get excited. Dun, 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 okay, and they're like, oh, it's coming. Here we go, I'm getting ready, I'm getting stronger now, right? Our mind plays music to amp us up for the experience. And that's what we're perceiving. So feel that stuff. I said, and I always ask them this, hey, have you ever been really, really excited or nervous and you hit a shot and it went like 10 yards further? Yeah. It's amazing how you always under pressure get the club face on the ball, isn't it? Yeah. See, you can play that way too. So what I'll do is sometimes I'll get at their heart rates up We'll do, you know, we'll run and we'll stuff, teach them some breathing. The main thing to do is accept it and realize that most of the people think, why am I wrong for feeling this way? You know, I shouldn't feel this way. Yeah, you should. 100% of the time. Every time. If you're not feeling that way, we got problems. Okay, so, so speaking of the Jaws theme, Dr. McCabe, uh, I want to bring up something that I asked you, asked you actually when I had you on with my students, and that's the yips. And, and sort of dealing with that. And, you know, I, uh, I mentioned that I dealt with it in, in the context of actually throwing uh, a baseball, not in golf. Uh, and it was, it's, well, it, it's still an ongoing a little bit, but it's an interesting exercise in what some of our students deal with. So yeah. your thoughts on that, on dealing with that phenomenon and, and, and trying to help people with that. Well, as I told you, I mean, I, I dealt with them chipping. So the yips to me are always, they always originate from an underlying mechanical flaw that was fine for the longest time until it wasn't. And usually it wasn't because it was associated with being really embarrassed and trying to avoid it ever happening again. It follows panic attacks to a T. If you've ever had panic attacks, I have, they're brutal. All you wanna do is escape and get away from the pain that you're in and you pray that you'll never be in that situation again. So you start evaluating where the bears are. Same scenario, right? Oh my God, if I walk in that room and have a panic attack, I can't get out of there. Oh my God, I missed a green. I don't, oh, it's wet over there. Okay, well, mine was chipping. Strong grip, bad setup. And so what I did is I had one of my players came in with an orange whip wedge trainer and he was chipping with it. And I'm like, oh, I don't have a chance to hit that thing. But I bought one and I figured it out and I found my way through it. So what happens in the yips is I always say, look, we're gonna name it that Bob is here. When you have those negative thoughts that Bob is, that you're starting to get stressed about a short putt or whatever, just Bob's here, okay? So I was playing the other day, playing a money match, and my chipping has gotten really, really good. I love to pitch and chip now. Um, but I had a situation, I was playing with my buddy who's an instructor, who's a coach, and he's got a brilliant short game. Um, and we were playing, and we were playing five-man wolf, and I was his partner. And so he and I are always, I mean, even though we're partners, we're just ripping on each other endlessly. And he's like, great. My partner's got the yips chipping and this is what I got to deal with. And so what was my natural inclination? Oh God. Oh my God. And like, well, let me hurry up and hit this chip and get out of it. Right. Oh, that's the escape mechanism. Pull the escape shoot. Get out of here. And I stopped and I said, I stopped. I said, yeah, you're right. You're right. I said, it's gonna suck when I drain this on you as my partner. And I slowed down and I sat in it for a minute and I lifted out and it was a tough chip, but it was, instead of being in a hurry to get away from Bob, the best thing to do is just acknowledge Bob's here, okay? 
take a couple deep breaths. Now, what's the one thing that I need? For me, pitching and chipping, there's one very clear mechanism that I have to do. Once again, it may not be right mechanically. I drop my left foot way back. I, I make sure my, my, my shoulders feel level. Okay, I don't, from a technical standpoint, I don't know if it works or not, but the orange whip wage trainer, I can hit flop shots all day with it, okay? But it works. It gives me something to anchor into. So what I tell players who have short yips, you know, putting yips or whatever, you're not going to make it anyways. So let's put a good pass on it. Let's find the one thing to do. You know, I put, I put 95% of the time two-handed, right hand low. But when I'm inside five feet, I putt with a claw. Not because I had the yips putting, I like the feel of it. So what I do is I tell them, tell me what you can do when you're inside short putts that you like to feel. I've had one player who lined it up off the toe from five feet and in. It was awkward enough that he liked it and he worked, he got through it. But I tell him, it's not gonna automatically go away. You've got the trauma and the drama in your mind that is gonna show up at the wrong times when you don't want it to. It's all, Bob is always there. Some days Bob is really pro prominent, some days Bob's not, but never be in a hurry. Instead, realize that you can play with Bob just fine. Um, and again, everybody, just as a reminder, throw some questions in there if you have any. So in dealing with the tour players that you deal with, what, uh, what are some of the lessons and, and things we can learn from the best players in the world uh, and why they are uh, where they are you know, given they're, you know, they're in that top 1%, uh, what gets them there? And what are some of the things that you've learned from them and maybe that you've helped them with that can help us and our students? Well, I, I, for, success for me is a four prong approach. The first prong is they got to have a certain skill level and talent level, but the best of the best do the simple things better than everybody else. Like you can show me a great college player all day long. If he can't get the ball up and down from in front of a green and have a tap in, we're wasting our time. If he can hit it, He's got a 130 ball speed. I don't care how great it is on the days it's good. If he can't get the ball off the tee consistently with a club that goes in the short grass, when pressure hits, it's going to be a problem because skills and talent, it's not a talent contest. The, the separation, there's very few players that have a talent advantage on the PGA Tour. There's very few players that have a talent differential in the NBA. You know, Kevin Durant does. Shaquille O'Neal had size. Michael Jordan could jump out of a gym. Okay. Um, but it's their second prong is how do they apply that under pressure? So you can have, I mean, I walk up and down the line and I have many tour players that come see me all the time and they're like, they'll give me their stats. And my question is always when it's under pressure and it's hitting the fan, what do you do? What are your mistakes? How does stress pressure impact you in four areas? Four, not five, four. Uh, one, physically, how does it impact you psychologically? How does it impact your decision-making? And how does it impact your grit? It impacts all of us in, someone, in, in those areas all the time. Um, so you got to know what to go to when it gets hard. Um, so pressure is an ultimate separator. Pressure, though, is also like this cup, right? An empty cup is a cup. It doesn't matter how many holes in it. It doesn't realize it has holes in it until you put water and pressure under it. Then it exposes the cracks. And so what I want them to understand, and the best players look at that and go, well, I've got a couple cracks over here I've got to improve in. But the best players play from their strengths. They don't play from their, their absence or their weaknesses. Um, you know, Mickelson has always been chaotic on the golf course. He's great when he's great. Tigers always struggle to get the ball off the tee. He's the best iron player to ever play the game. Um, the, you know, when you look at those things, it's like, okay, well, you know, Justin Verlander at throwing 100 miles an hour is going to give up home runs because he throws hard. Um, Max Scherzer is going to throw a lot of pitches. I mean, you just, everything's got a secondary to it, okay? Um, you know, and I think the third one is how can you be mentally flexible? Can you be in situations, learn from it, and continue to grow? Can you adapt and adjust to the circumstances you're in without making it personal? So, you know, a player, uh, uh, Sawgrass is a perfect example. You know, the early morning tea times went out, the winds were calm, there was no stress, the water, you know, there's still dew on the greens, the ball. Hideki Matsuyama shot nine under. So who's the player that's going to show up at the afternoon tea time and look up and go, ha oh, crap, I'm nine shots behind. Now the wind's blowing 15 to 20. Different course, right? So being mentally flexible enough to go, hey, I've got 72 holes. He's got 60, he's got 54. Okay. So I don't have to get them all back. I don't have to be sitting at nine under after the round. The likelihood of him doing that tomorrow is not as high. 
Okay, so just go play my game. The last one is circumstance and luck. We can't control that. There are guys that have gotten through. There's guys that have won on tour who got lucky. Um, they took advantage of the luck that that was afforded them. Doesn't mean they weren't skilled and talented and all the other stuff. It's just they got a good opportunity. Um, you know, Tom Brady was in the right position when Drew Bledsoe went down. That team was really good. I was living in Providence at that time. They weren't bad. They had a great defense. And as a young rookie quarterback, he could move into a situation and lead and distribute the ball accordingly. Well, then what happened was he started building confidence of being really, really good there. So, you know, we look at those things and you start saying, okay, that's what great success is, um, is, is building across those factors. And as a teacher, we have to understand that. A lot of times we always focus on the first and the fourth. We ignore the middle two, which is really what defines greatness, is how do you find your best each day when you don't have your best? I mean, you're never going to have your best. You'll play one time in your lifetime and have all your tools. One time, because that's what the definition of best is. Uh, There's a great question here from Don. Yeah, and so, yeah, just making sure everybody reads it. But teaching a gentleman for years, decent player, battle topping the ball with his driver. It's the only club in his bag he tops it with. And once it happens during a lesson, he's done mentally. Any suggestions? And I, I Don, next can to Don me. speak up? Can, Don, can you get off mute? I don't know who Don is. Yeah, Don, sweet, I'm going to get you off. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Hey, have you ever tried to get him to top it on purpose? Did you hear that, Don? I'm with you. Yeah, did have you, you hear ever, him? Have you ever tried to get him to top it on purpose? I'm sorry, Brett, one more? Yeah, have you ever tried to get him to top it on purpose? Uh, no, I've never tried that. Try that. And what, once he does it once, he's done. Okay, but it's an avoidance mechanism. And you can talk to him about what does it mean. Well, let's go ahead and flood it then, right? So, hey, I want, we're going to start off the lesson today, and I want you to hit 10 tops before we get going. Okay. And see what he does. If he, if he hates you after that, call me. I've, well, had him, uh, a lot of, I've had him try to pop it up, which is almost the opposite. Yeah. And that sort of hasn't worked either. Try, try it. Try him once or twice. Say, hey, look, I know when you top a ball, it means something bad to you. You get frustrated and you get really tense. Yep. If I showed you how to do it, then you probably won't do it again. Okay. So one of the best things you do with people who have panic attacks is you make them have a panic attack. Gotcha. So in other words, it's not as bad as you think. I mean, tour players don't think shanks are bad, do they? <laughs> Good question. They don't. They'll laugh about it. Now, don't get me wrong. It's still in their head. But, yeah. I mean, shoot, Webb Simpson's got no problem with them. Yeah, that's true. So you just got to kind of look at it as that's the thing that we fear. What's the worst about topping it? Well, it's the embarrassment. A good player would never top it. Um, yeah, they do. Okay. We just, you just don't see it because you only see the best players play. Um, that's why I love watching um, – um, PGA Tour live during the week because they show all the ugly. I mean, you're going to be out there with a group that guys shooting 79 mm -hmm. and they top it, they skull it, you know, and our players forget that. So I'd try to get them to top it a little bit. And then I'd also teach them how to um, play the limits a little bit. Hit me a big, hard draw. Give me a big, hard cut. Now let's hit one down the middle. Give me a big sweeping draw, a big sweeping cut. Now hit one down the middle. I think, I think it's sometimes we forget. I mean, the, the first thing that somebody taught me to do when I was learning to ski was how to put my skis back on at the mid mountain. Because mm -hmm. you're going to fall. So let's take care of the thing that you know you're going to deal with first. Okay. Now, how do you stand back up laying on the side of a mountain? All right. Did that. Okay. Got that taken care of. Brett, so the, uh, and, and again, I teach next to Don uh, daily. So, and I've seen the student he's talking about, and it's, yeah. I mean, it's like a light switch, but so what's the, you know, when somebody's trying to make a change or dealing with adversity like that, you know, there's certain players who are going to sort of uh, dig their heels in and keep rolling and there are others are just going to, you know, shrug, put the shoulders down and quit. I guess the question really is what's the difference between those two people and maybe how do you, well, I, yeah, just put a, I just put a chat up there and it was watch oh, yeah. the backwards bike video. Um, and, and what it is, is that 
there are certain factors that we can do very easily. There's certain factors that we can't. We don't know what they are until we encounter them, okay? So what I tell people is going through a change is that Tiger said it best. I'm gonna do it in a scaled approach. If I can do it at home on the range, then I move to at home on the course. Now, I still go out and play, but if I'm not at 80% at home on the range, why would I think that I'm confident at home on the course? So he lowers his expectations and he realizes he's, he's using other skills to balance the, the battle. So what I try to get them to realize is that they don't have to be great to play great. But I also know it's really hard to play the game. But when the swing isn't coming off well, what do we do? We start chasing swing. Now we're using the golf course to validate a swing. So we do it, of, uh, I call it, you know, the buckets. At home on the range, at home on the course, when it matters on the course, good round on the course, then, and then for better players in tournaments. Um, and so what they do is though they go, oh, I can do it. I think I can do it at home on the range. It should be able to do it at home on the course. Based on what? You have no evidence. So I'm going to take a, a fighter pilot that can fly a, a prop plane and load him up in the, or her up in the back of an F-15? No. Oh yeah, now land that little thing out there on an aircraft carrier. No chance. And so I use a lot of those experiences when they realize it and they do it because what happens, so one of my players going through a massive swing change is, you know, they, they, he's like, I want to, I've got to see the results right now. But I'm like, you know, when you're mid mountain of a climb, it sucks. You don't, no one ever goes, got it in anything in life. We don't realize that we got it until we look back later and go, man, I was really starting to hit the ball good then. So I try to reframe their minds so that they can see the depth and the development of what they're doing. Gotcha. Uh, Brett, just uh, as we're winding down here, do you want to take a minute maybe and just um, make sure uh, everybody knows where they can, I mean, I think most people know, but where they can find you and also, and yeah, you put the Catalyst School up there, maybe just a brief note about yeah. what that's all about. So I'm gonna give credit to, to one person, but there's a couple others that have been very influential in that. So I, I went out to, over Christmas, I went out, after Christmas, I went out to Vegas to do an interview with somebody. And then I ran by and had dinner with Jeff Smith, um, radar golf guy. And you know, why he has terrible taste in football teams, um, he, he said something that night that was great, which was, he says, look, Brett, he goes, I love following your information for my students, but you don't have anything for coaches. And I said, I got this, I got that. And he goes, nah, you don't. And he said, I really want help. And, you know, I think we all want to coach better. He said, you're one of the few people in our field that works across 15 different domains. You played for the coach that's won more national titles in baseball than anybody else in the modern era. You coach for the guy who coaches football with more national titles than anybody in the national era you work with gymnastics it, it all those different things um and so what what he did was he said look i want you to start something and my buddy who works with me in my company has his master's in organizational leadership and he said why don't we create a catalyst school why don't we become the catalyst for the catalysts and so let's take the information that we do working in football basketball gymnastics golf tennis corporate business settings, all these other things, and bring them into one place so that people aren't having to go to 15 different sites. So the Catalyst School has two things. One is there's a master class coming that is filmed and done, it's fantastic. And then it's about the different factors that lead to you being a catalyst, your connection to students, how do you develop a plan for them, stuff like that. But then the really cool thing that I'm most excited about, because it's cheap, so I think it'll be $19 a month. It's called the Catalyst School Live. And what that is, is it's four live webinars a month um, where you're going to have a front row seat and the things that either I'm going to bring in coaches from different sports that are going to come in. I'm going to talk about topics like why is presentation so important? How do you commit? A lot of the questions you've asked me today, they're going to be highly interactive, highly engaged. There's no monthly commitment. It's month to month um, for under 20 bucks a month. You're going to have that. You're going to have library resources, tons of videos that I've already filmed with coaches that are not on my platforms right now, um, across multiple sports about what does it make it, what makes it important and what doesn't. So it's a great question there about Graham McDowell. But if you guys go to uh, the Catalyst School, please um, just put in your email, at least stay on our email list. Um, it launches in May. I'm telling you, um, the information is ridiculous. It's so good. It's gotten me so fired up to what I do. I love working with coaches. Coaches have been the greatest impact and influence of my life. Um, and, and I wanna give that back. So it's priced really, really well. 
what helped GMAC turn the corner? I think a couple of things. Um, GMAC started working with John Graham uh, in his putting, which I thought was a brilliant move. Um, Graham also's life calmed down a little bit. His life has been very busy over the years. Um, you know, he's, he's very smart. Um, he's very into business, but he also, he and his wife had two kids and you know, anybody who's had kids that's trying to compete against the world's best know if you're a good hearted human being and a good souled man, you don't like to be away from your kids to practice and you want to help your wife out. Um, he's not one of those guys that's like, that's your job and this is my job. That was their job. Um, he also has reconnected with Kevin Kirk. Um, and mentally, some of the things that we've been talking about for a long time, he started doing more and more. And, and maybe through me or through some other mental help that he's gotten, what I mean by that is he, he GMAC keeps a library around him. So he'll work with me. He'll work with other guys. He'll, he'll, he'll read a lot. He'll take in information. Graham is always the one that'll call and say, hey, uh, I want you to be upset, but I read this in a book. I'm like, why would I be upset? That's brilliant. Let's talk about it, dude. And so I think the spark happened. And then he started seeing some putts fall and he had some really good stuff and he started believing that how good he is. He's a brilliant player. He's a player. And, um, it, you know, instead of fighting the swing, you know, working with Kevin and then also working with Pete Cowan still, um, that was really good, but he's not competing against 15 other players on tour for Pete's time. And so he'll still use Pete, but he'll still use Kevin. He'll still use me. He'll still sometimes touch base with some, one of his guys over in England mentally. And so he's just really started believing how good he is. And um, he's, he's means a ton to me. Um, it's so, I'm so excited to see it for he and his wife and his kids. Um, and uh, you know, he's going to continue to play better and better and better. And um, he's re-engaged in what kind of like what happened to me, you know, it got back to what's important. A couple of years ago, he took me down to a conference in Orlando and uh, he and I went and saw Tony Robbins and Robert Herjavec and Gary Vaynerchuk. And it was such a cool day. And it was a birthday gift that he had given me. Um, that's the kind of guy he is. And so as a result, sometimes he gets distracted, um, but love the guy. And I'm so happy to see him having this success. He's a, he's a legend um, in a lot of ways. The, the thing about winning in Saudi Arabia was that course was very, very windy. And if you want to watch a guy control ball flight in the wind, Graham McDowell is a pretty damn good one to do it. Cool. Brett, last question. Uh, who, uh, who do you go to, to keep learning? Cause the, you know, the best in our profession, uh, generally speaking, seem to be constant learners. Where are you going to get better at what you do uh, um, or get, get inspired I mean, I think the coaches that I'm around, right? You guys, my coaches at Bama, um, I love studying entrepreneurship. Um, I love studying people who are in the entrepreneurship world. I love what Sarah Blakely does. There's a there's a author out of Texas. She's out of LA now called um, Rachel Hollis. I love what she teaches. Um, I love Gary Vanderchuk. I think he's great. Um, I don't read sports psych books. I don't not because I know the answers, just because I want to, I've always been the guy who reads a book about a military guy or a military woman and how they adapted and how I've incorporated it into me. Um, I, I also trust the, you know, I've got a, a group of people that I meet with on a regular basis or I reach out to, to communicate with, um, you know, the, some are psychologists, some are coaches, some are business people. And I just try to, to, to pick up and learn, but I, I observe, look, um, I don't know about being the best in the world at what I do. Um, that's a great compliment, but I don't know how you measure that. I'm, I'm still a squirrel trying to find the nut. Um, I'm still hustling every single day to learn. Um, I'm, I'm in a setting where, you know, it doesn't matter how many times my players win on the PGA Tour. If I can't get a certain kid to go out on the field, Coach Saban's going to be a little ticked off. Um, you know, I've got to get a player to get through a block on doing a round off back handspring on a balance beam. Um, I've got to show up to my kids every day and, and do that. So I'm a learner because I don't feel like, I feel like we're on the very tip of the iceberg of what we know mentally. I think the mental side of the game has historically been kind of the soft science, but true neuroscience is hard science. And we're just starting that journey. Um, the next 10 to 15 years are going to be impressive. Um, and I think what we've always known as the mental game, you guys are the most brilliant sports psychologists out there, teachers and coaches. Y'all teach great routines and products. Y'all know your players better than anybody. 
Um, so I'm excited about where that's going. And so I want to learn more than anything. And um, I haven't figured anything out. All I know is that I'm here today and, and try to be the best that I can be today. Well, Doc, uh, thanks so much for coming on here uh, and helping educate us and answering our questions. Truly appreciate all the, uh, all the support and your uh, willingness to share information with everybody. We really appreciate it and wish you the best and safe Thank you. Uh, safety to you and your family as we Absolutely. get through this mess. You too. And, and hey, check me, if you go to the catalystschool.com, there's some brilliant podcasts out there. Um, and there's some really, really good content. And there's a button there that says something about interviews. So make sure you follow that. There's, and those are all free. So anything that I can do to help, please let me know. Thanks so much, Doc. We appreciate it. Yeah, be good. Everybody Take else, we'll, we'll see you all uh, next week. Uh, May 4th is uh, another Associate Development Day for Associates. And then uh, the 7th, Bernie's Neighborhood. Bernie's uh, Najar's got something going on for us uh, as the webinars continue. So hope you all can uh, join in. Make sure you're emailing uh, the particular host to sign up. And I uh, hope you enjoyed it today. And have a great rest of your day. We'll talk to you all soon.